Hey everyone, I'm back with another review and today it's Fujifilm's Instax SQ6 Square Instant Camera. So I've never been a huge instant camera or instant film buff. I have experimented, I've used Polaroid originals on some vintage Polaroid cameras and I was never too impressed with the results. It was very inconsistent, the price can be a little bit high so a few months ago I just thought to spend some money, get one of these things and try it out and I actually sold my Polaroid camera and decided to try this out instead. So first of all, let's have a look and see what you get inside the box. So you do get the batteries included, they're two CR2 type batteries, which is nice because they can be a little bit expensive. So that's probably one of the cons of this camera is it is a slightly expensive type of battery. And you also get the camera strap, you get some little flash filters, and obviously the camera. I do quite like the design. It's a nice sort of flat design. It's lightweight, fits in your bag easily. So that's one of the first things I really quite liked about this compared to some of the bulkier Polaroid cameras and Instax wide stuff I'd seen. I was pretty torn up about whether to get this or a Lomo or instant wide. And I ended up just going with this one and thought it would be a cool camera to review. So looking at the camera, all the controls are here on the back. They've got little indicator lights and some switches here to change between modes. The lens extends quite quickly and smoothly when it's switched on and off. Um, with the controls, you've got mainly just different focus modes between automatic, which is a mid-range focus, uh, close focus for selfie mode, and probably the macro might be the same thing. And you've got a distant focus, which is good for landscape stuff, obviously. Uh, after that, you have the double exposure mode, which is pretty cool. And then you have a lighten and darken, which is kind of like a, an exposure compensation. And then towards the bottom, you have that film counter. With the buttons, there's the main one to switch between modes. Then you have the self timer and the flash off control, which can be really handy when you don't want to use the flash. So the viewfinder is up on the right hand top side here, which I found a little bit unusual. I'm used to cameras, especially rangefinder style ones, having it on the left. So for right eyed shooters like myself, I still have my left eye free to have a bit of peripheral vision. So it's sort of blocking your face when you're looking through it. A little bit odd, but you kind of get used to it. I actually messed up a few times and instinctively rotated the camera off to this side to have peripheral vision and I ended up forgetting that because it's a square the long the larger border ended up being on the side of the photo so I had a couple of results that um, you know you have to hold sideways to see them the right, area, right way around and um, it's a little bit weird but you know it's still all right I after that tried to get used to holding it the right way up every time the shutter button is on the front of the camera nice and easy just where your finger tends to lie when you're looking through it so that's nice you have the tripod socket at the bottom, so you can put this on a tripod and do some nighttime stuff or group shots or whatever. I think it does do longish exposures of up to a second or two, which is quite nice. Loading the film is fairly easy. It comes in cartridges like any other Instax film. So each cartridge has 10 sheets in it. At the moment, they only have 10 and 20 packs. And I'm really looking forward to maybe bulk packs coming out. So the only thing with this film is it is a little bit pricey, especially compared to Instax Mini. However, I've never been a big fan of Instax Mini. I did always like the square shape of the Polaroid ones, but that was even more expensive and less consistent. So a lot of wasted shots. Uh, with these, you can get the 20 pack, it saves you a little bit, but I'm really looking forward to seeing if they come up with bulk packs like they do with the Mini, maybe a 50 pack, and you know, trying to buy it online can save you a little bit of money, but I'm also looking forward to the monochrome if they ever release that. So overall, I quite like the results you can get from this camera, especially in terms of the colors and consistency with exposure compared to the Polaroid originals, which I have some of here. You can see that the colors on this can be really inconsistent and wild. Sometimes you get really weird defects in the film. It's very um, finicky with how it develops. With this stuff, you have to either, you know, sometimes put it in your pocket if the weather's too cold or keep it somewhere cool if the weather's too hot. And the colors were always just that little bit faded and off, which can be all right, but then it's never that consistent either. And when you're spending, you know, 30 to 40 Australian dollars, uh, an eight pack of these, it just became un unreasonable for, for me, at least with the camera I had. I don't think it was the best camera, but with the Fuji film, it's far more consistent. I like the colors more and it's, it's cheaper per shot as well. So even though it's a square, it's smaller, but it's not too bad. It's still a decent size. It's more real estate than you get with Instax mini. So. I quite like it from what I've shot so far. The first thing I did obviously was shoot some outdoor stuff. I found the best way this camera performs is in nice bright conditions. So with landscape stuff, it works quite well. I've got some, some landscapes here and shots that I took while maybe doing other reviews or out on road trips. I'll just take this camera with me 
because it's nice and light, I could just leave it in the bag and not worry about it. But really great colors, especially in high contrast, bright scenes, you'd think that it would look a bit too harsh, but because instant film kind of softens everything, I really like the way it looks on some of the shots like this one where you have those bold colors and, and it actually has a little bit of that Fuji film look with the cooler pastel tones sometimes. The other thing I found it was really good for is portraits. Again, with that nice softer look and great colors, it's really good for portraits. I uh, took it with me when Sarah and I did the Ektachrome review. There's a couple of shots of her here. With this one, it is a little bit green or on the cool side. That is again, because we're in the shade, that's something that's gonna happen with any camera or film if it's locked into daylight balance, which it is. Um, otherwise, it's really quite nice, especially in golden light. It softens everything back up and you get really nice sort of little snapshot type photos and uh, I quite like the way it looks for portraits. In this session, I was out with Ernest, just shooting some large format and doing various stuff, uh, other reviews. And um, that was a nice opportunity to, to try and use this camera using some of the, the modes on the back. So I think with backlit scenes especially, it's good to use the light and control. You don't want the backlit sky to trick the automatic exposure in the camera and then underexpose your shot. So I find even though it can be a little bit on the bright side, I would prefer that than it being underexposed because the background obviously isn't as important as the person you're shooting in a portrait. So with most of these portraits, they were used with, um, with the light and control for all the backlit ones, except maybe for, for the one um, over here, which didn't have too much of a backlit background. So you can see it's a little bit darker, but it's a nice even tone on that one. So the camera also had that macro mode, which I tried out a couple of times. This is a good example of a macro shot. This was focused pretty close. I think it does about 30 to 50 centimeters roughly. I'm not too sure on that, but I think that's about as far as this was, about 50 centimeters with the flowers here. And I really like how this came out, even though I had that bright sky in the background, exposure was spot on and the sharpness is actually not too bad for an instant camera. So the next feature on the back control light panel there is the double exposure feature, which is really cool. I was actually not really expecting it to perform very well, but I tried doing some classic double exposure using the silhouette technique where you take a photo of someone or something silhouette with a bright overexposed background. So the overexposed background pretty much uses up the exposure latitude of the film and the second shot won't really show as much information on the bright part, but it will over the silhouette part of the photo, as you can see in these two shots um, that I've got here. These are the ones where I made that sideways mistake, but really cool, unique result using the double exposure mode of that camera. It does take a bit of practice. I think I wasted some and they, not all of them came out too great. This one I wasn't too happy with, there's a couple of others. But once you nail it and you remember what to do, it can be really cool, like it's got a lot of potential. So I also took the camera out to something they had here in Melbourne called the Fire Gardens a while back. And I was intending to try and do some nighttime stuff with it, but I didn't really end up being able to utilize it. Number one, the subject matter didn't really work out for me. I was too busy using you know, my digital camera. And I also didn't really bring a tripod, so it was a little bit tricky to try and use that camera. I thought it would be a chance to use those little, you know, quirky flash gels that come with the camera. What those do is you can place them on top of the flash unit there, basically to give the flash a color output. So I took one shot on that. It's a little bit gimmicky. I mean, it just makes your subject red. Not something I think I would use much unless I found some really cool creative way to use it. On the box there, they have some better examples of how that's been used. I thought that was cool, but I didn't quite really take full advantage of that. Um, with shots using the flash at night seems to work fine. Exam not, the, not the best example. And uh, also with longer exposure times, I tried putting it down on the ground and using the automatic exposure to just do, I think, what was about one or two seconds, but it didn't really come out too great. So I don't know if it's just because I didn't choose the best example, but um, it's worth maybe experimenting with nighttime stuff if you really want to do that. But I don't think that's what this camera is really best for. What I did also like about it is the ability to just chuck it in my bag when I was taking other cameras and use it just for everyday documentary stuff and even some street stuff. So on one occasion, I actually took it out with me. It's nice and small again, fits in the bag with other stuff. And I took some street style shots that you can see here. I've got some uh, just shots of like an abandoned, you know, motor garage here. And you can kind of see that some of these shots, the, the viewfinder is a little bit off what you're seeing and the viewfinder might be centered, but everything kind of shifts off a little bit to the right. So I kind of learned that lesson and, you know, I accidentally, you know, wasted a shot to find that out, recomposed it. And you can kind of see that the shot, you need to move the camera a little bit to the left. It's not just parallax error, but it's even things that are in the distance 
they're not perfectly centered if you're trying to get that centered look. So with this shot here of the, the sign in the middle of the road, I actually overcompensated. I put the sign off center, moved the camera to the left and the shot ended up coming out perfectly centered almost. So that's one thing to keep in mind with this. You can't really trust the viewfinder on that, especially up close, you will get parallax error. So if you're pointing at something, looking through here, you have to remember the lens is actually there pointing it at the subject. So you need to move that to, to compensate for the parallax error. So for this review, I obviously scanned all these shots, which I used my own custom made holder for. Now I got this idea straight out of a video that was made by Matt Day over on his channel. So he used um, a different material, but he actually recommended that it would be better to use some, some cardstock. So what I did is just followed his instructions that he used for the, for the foam core, but I used cardstock and cut out four little spots where I could put in the instant film prints and put them on the flatbed scanner, which I use the V800 for, and it gave me pretty good results. What I would recommend, obviously, is making sure that the height off the scanning bed is correct. Uh, I think that with the scanner I use, it's about three millimeters. So I tried to make sure that where the, the print lies, it's gonna be at least three millimeters off the, the glass. Otherwise you won't get the sharpest result. So what you can do, I actually um, put in little bumps of cardboard, which I taped over with this archival tape just to raise it a little bit further. So you can just do some tests and just make something like that yourself. I'll put a link to that video so you can check that out if you actually do wanna make something like this. It's a really cool idea, so I wanna thank Matt Day for coming up with that one. And in terms of settings, I would just say experiment. You don't really need a very high resolution when you're scanning um, little prints like this because they're actually much bigger than your average negative. So I think I used about 600 DPI and that's more than enough for you know, using it in videos or online. And the good thing with the holder is that you can do quite a few at a time, change them over, you still have your four masks selected. You can just copy and, and paste and just sort of, you can readjust them. So they lay over the, the prints if you've loaded this in a slightly different position. So that really worked quite well, as opposed to putting the prints straight on the flatbed glass, which didn't give me the best result. So overall, I'm quite impressed with the Fujifilm Instax SQ6 and with the new square film, which I think it's a great alternative to Polaroid. If you just want something for happy snaps, it's sharp enough, it's consistent. The price is okay, it's a little bit on the high side, so that's one thing I wish was a little bit lower. And one thing that I think would be really awesome is if I can find a way to somehow use it in medium format cameras like the Pentax 6.7, because it just so happens that the size of the print is almost the same as a 6.7 negative would be lying in the back of that camera. So if anyone ever came up with an idea to make a holder for that, that would be awesome. But I think it would be a lot of trouble. So maybe one day in the future. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to using the SQ6 a lot more going forward. Good camera, good fun, chuck it in the bag and it doesn't weigh too much. So it's a nice alternative to Polaroid originals if you don't want to spend too much. This video wasn't sponsored by Fujifilm, but if anyone from there is watching, I'd be more than open to talking about reviewing future products or films and please bring out that monochrome film for the square. That, that'll be really cool. All right guys, so thanks for watching this quick review on the Instax SQ6 and I'll catch you on the next one.